Hey everybody, welcome to DBS Films Podcast. My name is Kellen, with me as always my brother Brendan, and together we make movies with DBS Films. Today we're going to part two on tips in the production process. Really on these episodes we want to go ahead and get more tactical for you, little tips that hopefully can help increase your momentum, which again is one of the most critical things you can have on set. As always guys, be sure to take a look at us online, you can take a look at our movies, but you really want to go ahead and join our Discord channel because that is where all the fun is at, and that's where we can can work with our fans to not only get them in the movies but get their ideas on what we want to do next because we really want to be a community focused and driven film studio so before we go ahead and get started on some of the more in detailed items you know i really want to kind of just get an overall view what your opinion is as a filmmaker in the in the production process you know again we really do see it as the main thing is maintaining momentum it's going to be a lot harder than you think it's going to be and really sticking to that bell curve and understanding the ebb and flow of a production is going to be what saves your you know movie from going into the void in post-production yeah i mean i I totally agree i think that you know, the biggest problem in produ- production, uh, in production wise, is not a failure to actually do pre production properly. And I think any issues that really arise on production could have been solved in pre production. And, you know, that's, that's just a, a big thing that you have to learn. And I think, you know, when I move into production, I've spent so much time in pre production that my only goal is to really just get the actors in a place where they feel comfortable. They understand the vision of the movie. They understand the direction I'm giving them and just keep that momentum as long as I possibly can before, you know, we have to break for food or we have to just stop shooting for the night. And, you know, that's just my philosophy. I think that you kind of let them do the job that they're supposed to do, which is act. I'm not sitting here and I don't have time to really sit and have a million takes and try and micro analyze every reaction and tonality and, you know, every little thing that they're trying to do. I think that's just going to cause frustration. You know, my goal is to get everyone on the same page, get them comfortable and, you know, let them go. You're hiring them as actors. So they should be able to do the job themselves. And I think that's just my overall philosophy. All the hard stuff should be done or addressed in pre-production and the production should just be, you know, me making sure that momentum's continually going. And I'm just making small little corrections, you know, throughout the set. Because any more time and effort devoted to that during the actual production is going to cost you time. It's going to frustrate people. And, you know, production is so fragile. And the amount of time and time pressure they're constantly feeling is going to be such an issue that, You just don't have the ability to do that. And if you start to actually micromanage your actors or your crew or your set, you're going to run out of time and your production is going to suffer. I completely agree. It really is maintaining that momentum and it's getting everything that you possibly can, squeezing all of the actual seconds out of that shoot. Because again, time is money on production. So really, I think a lot of these tactical elements that we're going to start hopping into are less of, hey, this is how you do it really good, and more so, hey, this is how you prevent yourself from derailing the whole production. And there's a ton of tiny, tiny things that add up. And, you know, I think the first thing you can do is add more days to the shoot, which is, you know, very simple to do, but always plan for more, give yourself more time, because having pickups, they end up costing so much more than just adding additional days, usually to the, you know, um, just ability to scale when it comes to your costs. Uh, it's usually, you know, easier to add two more days and to book an entire set another time later in advance, coordinate that with your team and everything. But, you know, as an indie filmmaker, you don't have the luxury of just being able to have an unlimited day set with it. So, you know, do you want to kind of talk real quickly about how, at least I think my mindset has shifted from how do we get things that are perfect to how do we make sure we don't screw up? And I think that is, you know, we're more nervous on set of the failures then we are, you know, focusing on the successes to some degree. And I think as we get better, yes, we can't focus more on the successes, but as an indie filmmaker, man, you should just be looking for minefields. That's really what your job should be on the very first sets. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think just getting a finished product, something that you can upload is a win. That's exactly what you want. You know, the minute, uh, 
from the start of the production to, you know, finishing the production, I'm super nervous, super stressed. And it doesn't end until essentially I'm driving home, you know, from the production. But, you know, no matter what happens, um, if the movie's not turning out like I like, if I'm having certain issues or if there's just, you know, things are just not working well, I'm still pushing forward. I'm you know, remaining stoic. Uh, I'm not showing too much emotion. And in the back of my mind, it's just get something that you can upload. It could be the worst movie of all time. But as long as you upload it, you win because you're going to learn from that. You're going to get feedback from that. And most of the time, it's probably not going to be as bad as you think it is. I mean, I look at our first Hateful Eight movies, and they had a lot of issues, a ton of issues. But all that stuff is valuable feedback that we got. They're all learning experiences. And really, compared to a lot of other indie movies out there, those movies are not that bad. Um, So I may not like them, but for the most part, if you can just upload something, you win. And that should be the only objective that you possibly have during your entire shoot is just get something completed, something that flows and something that you can upload. Yep. And again, you know, in the first episode, we talked about how I think a lot of indie filmmakers have the wrong idea of you make one and then you blow up when you should find a way to consistently be able to make more movies over and over and over again. And that's really our mindset and how it is. And, you know, with that being said, I think we want to go ahead and hop into things that we see are going to be the biggest issues on set and ways that you can avoid them. And I think number one, and it sounds easy, but I'm always blown away, even by us in the very beginning and by a bunch other indie filmmakers, know how your equipment works. Know that it's ready, know that it has its firmware updates, know that you have memory in the sense of hard drives. So do you wanna just talk about know your gear? You should know that thing inside and out because if you're learning how something works on set, you're leaving yourself open for a nightmare when it comes to the editing process because there was a setting you didn't know about or this didn't pick up something that you thought about or any of those things that should be addressed in pre-production, you learn on set. And if you're not the DP and if you're not the one filming it, that means you need to work with the DP so that you as the producer can confirm they have the technical ability because technically flawed scenes cannot be used. Yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward and pretty common sense, but we struggle a lot with this, and I feel like it's probably not us to just struggle with it. You're doing a feature film, you have a bigger budget, you want to get better gear. Makes sense, right? The first shoot that we did, Gone, we tried to buy a Ronin, burnt out the motors because the DP didn't know how to use it. Then we struggled with the uh, Ronin for the next six or seven movies just because, and we bought this Ronin, but we just never really figured out how to work it. Struggle with the boom mic. Didn't know how to work it. Bad audio constantly. A lot of issues with camera stuff as far as, you know, we used two cameras and the cameras didn't have the same settings. Some were shooting in log, some were shooting in, you know, just rec 709 or whatever the basic setting is. Different ISO settings, you know, and different white balance settings. So we never really had a really technical understanding of like a lot of equipment they were using a lot of, we were figuring it out on set same thing as special effects you have, might have the inclination to just hire the special effects for the day of the shoot and never practice any of it well here's a spoiler special effects and how to shoot special effects is just as much on the dp as is the person doing the effects you have to hide hoses you have to hide you know, different cuts and you have to know how to, number one, you have to know how to shoot it. You have to make sure your special effects person knows how to actually execute it properly. Then you have to know how to edit it. All that stuff goes into it. And if you mess up one of those things, you're not going to have a good special effects shot. And this is one thing we suffered for, you know, with a long time. So this needs to be done in pre-production. So it's not just equipment. It's just, you know, people that are, you know, on your set that just need to be, it just needs to be done in pre-production. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. It's just, you got to make sure you understand the equipment and the people that you're doing and all this stuff should be done in pre-production because if you're waiting to figure this stuff out on set, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. And I, again, a lot of these things that we mentioned, they're, they're the worst types of landmines because they're invisible. You know, how'd that look? Great. How'd that sound? Great. 
you know, were we reviewing it? Were we looking at it? You know, we had no clue. And the next thing which has happened in the onsite editor, um, which we'll kind of get into, uh, is one of the reasons why we did it just to make sure we had technical sound things. And that's what we look for. There are so many issues that arise that you won't know about until post-production. And the best way to you know, avoid those is to have a technical understanding because if it's technically broken, it's technically broken. If it doesn't look that good, okay, that's kind of opinion. You know, if the lighting's off, opinion. If it's out of focus, it's out of focus. You know, if it's not coming together, it's not coming together. If the audio is wrong, the audio is wrong. Those are all things that are just subjectively wrong and there's nothing you can do about it in the post-production process you basically have to scrap it and that is such a critically crucial issue that happens i think a ton of footage ends up being unusable and i think you know that's something i do want to talk about that you brought up i think filmmakers want to have the prettiest toys and everyone talks about the camera you know what camera are you shooting on what's this one i'm shooting on a red or whatever it might be and i 10 times out of 10 would rather have less optimal equipment that I knew exactly how to use than better equipment that I had no clue or very, very, very little understanding. I mean, honestly, I think as a DP or something like that, if I was in the producer role, someone saying we should rent this and they've never actually used it is a huge red flag to me. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, one of the biggest areas that we've improved upon is when we started doing these things, when you make a mistake, as a DP, yeah, you made the mistake and then the editor has to fix it. Well, if you're both the DP and the editor, you don't make that mistake again because you don't want to go through that process. So do you want to talk about how having that technical understanding of the equipment is so critical and don't even look at getting the fancy stuff until you at least understand what you're doing and can have a base product. And I honestly think had we embraced that from the very beginning, we would have been a lot better than we're at now. We probably could have cut down half the moves we made to get to the part that we're at because a lot of people, they overestimate their skills. Movie making is easy in their head. You know, everyone can make a film and it is so tough. They don't do the reps and the practice in pre-production. They show up on set and they try and learn, try and do it. And then they have an explosion in the post-production process. So, you know, what are kind of your thoughts on that? All you need is a camera and a tripod. <laughs> That's it. Like, if you can master a camera and a tripod and make it look good, you're ahead of 90% of people. And everyone wants a dolly shot. Everyone wants these cool running shots because they, once again, we go back to, they think they're Hollywood. It's not the case, man. It's hard to pull off the Hollywood shots. Not only do they have a lot of time, they have a lot of experience. Get good at the basics get good at a tripod or working with a shoulder rig or just using the Ronin. If you can master those three things right there, you can, you'll have 90% of your shots done. Um, and I think that's what you need to focus on. I'd rather go back. If I could go back in time, I'd focus on the basics rather than the nice Hollywood shots, the nice wonders and the crazy stuff, because guess what? doesn't really make a big difference. If you're not mastering the basics, if you can't master the basics of basic lighting, basic camera movement, and just basic camera settings and getting clean audio, then you have no business trying to scale up. Scaling up at that point is just going to add more to your problems. And I see it all the time. I made the same mistakes too. Our movies only got better when we went back to the basics. Girl in Cabin 13 most successful movie so far. It was shot with a tripod. It was shot with a shoulder rig. That's it. And we had a run in. That's it. Super simple movie. One location, two actors, very minimalistic. Guess what? It's our best movie. No one's complained about not having dolly shots and crazy shots. No one said anything about that. No one said anything about the lighting. I hate the lighting in that movie. I think... Um, you know, what people brought up and the feedback was more on story and script and plot. Well, guess what? That's the easiest stuff to fix. And I think everyone tries to go out of their way to make these crazy shots and try and mimic Hollywood when your problems aren't going to be, no one's going to be like, hey, this movie should have been more cinematic. They're going to go, if you get to that level, people are going to mostly complain about your story and character development and plot and pacing and that is the most valuable feedback you can get so 
I think you're looking at it the wrong way if you're trying to really upgrade your stuff and really get the, the highest end stuff without mastering the basics first. Because even once you master the basics, the feedback that you're going to get is on your story. And you don't need extra equipment to make a better story. You just have to be more creative. 100%. And I mean, I think one of the other things is like, you know, having that use of the tool, you get so much more efficiency out of it. I mean, I think one thing I want to highlight that I always talk about in past episodes, especially when we talked about the shapeshifter, where we're done with it, man, like we could not have done that shapeshifter plot had you not had the experience with the equipment and the reps that you had. And I think one of the things that people don't see is, yes, we have, you know, these movies, we have thousands of hours of B2B marketing videos that we did in the sense of testing the equipment, getting the lighting right, getting all of these things right. And it is a night and day difference of just using that equipment versus you know, having someone come in and, and be in uh, like, you know, basically putting their trust in their hand. And when you're not able to even understand what's going wrong as a filmmaker, it's really hard to ensure that that does not happen. So, you know, I, I think one thing I really do want to highlight is the more you put additional equipment, additional staff, additional everything, the more elements of the movie can go wrong. And a lot of those elements that we just talked about are things you will not see until the post-production process. So I really do think the best thing you can do is film it yourself, you know, edit it yourself, whatever that project might be, so that you can ramp up to it. I really do think at this level, unless you have someone who is as committed to the project as you, I personally think it is a massive liability to have someone else be a DP on this project, unless it is someone that has Hollywood reps and unless you're paying them Hollywood salary. You know, again, the reason the dolly shots are so good is because this person's job is to do dolly shots. They wake up every day, they go to the Hollywood sets, they do that dolly shot that that's been requested because they've done it a ton of time. The person you might be working with maybe has seen a dolly. Maybe has used a dolly once or twice. Like I'm just, it's just what you end up seeing in this industry. And again, I, I understand why, because it's really tough to get budgets together. It's really tough to make sets come to life. So this is my warning to filmmakers. You know, if you're working with other people, make sure you vet them you know, heavily. And again, we had fantastic team, fantastic crews that allowed us to get a finished product, but there's so much that happens time and time again, where you'll never see the finished product. And a lot of the time, if you're not the person filming it or doing it, you take a lot of risks. So I think that's one little thing I wanted to have you touch on is the added risk element of other people. You know, I almost feel like if I would look back at this, I would try and do what we're doing, where it's just, you know, essentially people who are fully committed to DBS films. You know, me and my brother, we're not taking any money out of this. We're just doing it, putting it back in there. It's a passion of ours. It's our dreams. We're fully committed. And this is not a paycheck to us. This is something that is going to take a lot of time. We understand it. And because of that, we're able to really go through this process and learn. So you just want to talk about the risk of essentially, you know, hiring out. And at first how we thought it would help our production. And really it just hindered it, not because of the team, but because of our lack of experience. Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think number one, it was, you know, my lack of experience. I didn't have a clear vision. I was requesting things that I saw in Hollywood and, you know, I wanted those shots and we just couldn't pull them off, but I didn't know that. You know, I was making the same mistakes I was just talking about before. So that comes from experience. Um, and then, you know, when you hire other people on that don't have a lot of experience, you kind of create this set full of people that just don't have any experience so they're trying to learn on the job i'm trying to learn on the job they're asking me for input and trying questions and trying to figure out what to do looking for me to have guidance and i don't know what i'm doing so it's like it's the blind leading the blind essentially and that's not any way you want to you know lead a set I think the issue that a lot of indie films make because you have to do it on a budget is finding talented people to work with is extremely difficult, if not impossible. I think that all the people who are in this industry that are very good, very passionate and very hardworking are working for Hollywood or they're working for Netflix or they're working on bigger productions. The people who are not are 
essentially, you know, they're looking for experience and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing saying that, you know, they can grow and work with you as well. They're just not the best of the best, um, which makes it difficult, you know, as an indie filmmaker, when you're trying to get like a really good DP or really get people to help you out, you know, you're working with people who are willing to work for experience and work on your budget, but they, you know, they're looking for the experience. If you're coming into an indie film and you're trying to, you know, hire out to make your process easier, you're going to have a bad time. And that's what I said. I was like, listen, I'll hire a whole bunch of people that know what they're doing, that we can accelerate our timeline and have a better product. Well, unless you're getting people who are really in the Hollywood or in the industry, and you're going to have to pay a ton of money for those people. Um, you're not going to find that help out there. It's going to be everyone for themselves, which is why you need to be the champion of all your films. So and even if you were to get those Hollywood people and pay a lot of money for a really good DP and a lot of money for a big set, you're still going to fail because you don't have the experience yourself to actually communicate clearly and, you know, understand the process. These people that, you know, are used to a Hollywood set are probably just going to get frustrated at you and the whole production is just going to fall apart. So I think you just have to understand what you're working with and you have to understand that you are the champion of your film. And people are going to look for you for advice and guidance. And you have to find a way to acquire that knowledge, whether it's experience, whether it's just heavy pre-production or if, whether it's doing a whole bunch of shorts, you have to have that knowledge. You have to be the most knowledgeable person on that set. Cause if you're not, they're going to flush it out. And once you start to crack, man, it's going to be, you're going to be in for a rough time. Oh yeah. I think that's a great way to put it. You know, you're either doing this for experience or you're doing this to get paid. Um, and there's a mix of both, you know, honestly, and it's not saying someone who's doing it for experience can't then go on to be part of those Hollywood or those Netflix levels. But I mean, that's the level of experience that gets you. And again, you do not have the budget to compete with those. So you're basically forced to look more for people learning. And as we said, you know, we're learning too. So it just really is something to keep in mind when you are doing this and, you know, try and work with them in pre-production, try and understand where the, the simple technical levels are, because a lot of times there can just be gaps you know if you didn't know this about the equipment because it's your first time doing it it's your first time filming cinematic that's not on you that's just part of the learning process and realistically if there's an issue that comes up because of one of the team members that you selected that's your fault it's your fault you picked that person you you did it you didn't do the, the verifications you can't blame anyone else but yourself because if you ever start to try and blame someone else besides yourself, well, you're just never going to make it. It's just, that is not the mindset to have. So with that being said, I want to kind of start moving, you know, technical issues. The other thing that comes up is, you know, just not having the right props and everything. This is more a pre-production element to it. But I think a lot of times something that can completely derail your momentum is not having those right equipments too. So before we kind of hop into other things, kind of want to just touch on the bell curve again you know I, I think the more we discuss about it the more i'm becoming a fan of it realistically what we see when it comes to protect or a set you have momentum you basically start up things are a little bit you know shaky just because everyone's new you're having new chemistry new actors talents you're just kind of getting into the groove of things you're kind of shaking out the nerves day two three four we try and do our hardest stuff because you're feeling it the most and then from there you're getting tired and the last four days you usually come down again we typically have an eight day shoot so it is going to be something different there but real quickly do you want to kind of talk about how you can literally apply this bell curve to every single one of the movies we've done and it's there for every single one of them yeah it's, it's the same process it's the same process every single time and i think you just see the difference in our experience of understanding the bell curve and you know the the effort that we put in pre-production watch the first eight movies that we did i'd probably say um the unseen probably followed the bell curve pretty well the uh whitlow house which is a crazy thing i think it didn't even have a bell curve just how crazy that whole shoot was into the forest failed the bell curve we saved the hardest stuff for last and the climax was not very good. Morgan estate saved the best for last or the hardest stuff for last wasn't very good. Same with devil in the room. And you may not see this stuff. You may be like, Whoa, those climaxes are pretty good. I'd pay a lot of money 
to go back and fix those climaxes up with um, with essentially pickups. So they all failed the bell curve test. Girl and Cabin 13 was the first one we really started to put the work to it. And that last climax sequence with Chloe running through the woods, probably one of our best sequences we've ever made. This is really good, really good uh, shot. Now that was a, a pickup day because she got in a car accident and we had to like move it. But for the rest of that film, like other than some, you know, some special effects issues, this is a pretty smooth shoot. Murder House, you know, we did follow the bell curve test. Um, we had like a, the climax of that movie was shot towards the end of the, the bell curve, but it wasn't that difficult. It was her just walking around in the dark. So it wasn't anything too crazy. And then when I think the shapeshifter, we mastered it. We did all the hard stuff first. We ended with B-roll and that was the first one that, you know, we really scheduled properly. And I think it shows in, you know, the production and the uh, overall quality of the actual movie. Completely agree. And so now what I want to kind of highlight is these are different areas of things that can go wrong to just completely explore your, your bell curve. Because again, the bell curve is momentum. But if you look at each day, it's kind of almost like a little ebb and flow to it. And your whole job is just kind of ride it, understanding that as things progress, they're going to get harder. So you really want to try and avoid some of the big pitfalls. And I think one of the biggest pitfalls that's going to happen on, um, you know, production is just a mismanagement of time. And I think one of the best ways, again, pre-production is always going to come back to the way that you manage times, having a very solid shot list, and then also getting the actors involved in the shot list too. You know, we really do want people to take ownership of this movie and understand that, you know, you're not just some tool to us to be like, actor, go in there and say the words. You're going to be forming the lines. You're going to be forming the dialogues. You're going to be forming the process. And you're part of the momentum. You're part of the onset chemistry. You're part of everything. And I think one of the ways to get people involved with our bell curve is right off the bat, we tell them hard stuff coming first. We nail this is going to be good. And one of the ways we can get that done is through our shot list. And one of the ways we do our shot list is we kind of like to have funny names for each one of the scenes. And it's just kind of a way, you know, it's a quick sign of like, you know, uh, like Sunny sees a scary or something like that, just to kind of basically say, hey, we're at this, we're at this. And when they see it checking off the list, they can feel that momentum growing and they can get an understanding. So do you think that's a good way to literally frame the momentum and show everyone, hey, this is how the set's progressing. This is what we need to do. This is what you're accountable for. Yeah, I mean, honestly, one of the better things we've ever done. And it's not a shot list as far as like, we're just crossing off different sequences, different scenes. But every day I'll get up and I'll take the schedule for the day. And I'll write down on a little dry erase board every, uh, every scene that we need to do for the day. And I first started it just to, you know, make sure that I was on the same page with just myself. So I was using it myself. But something cool started to really happen where we finished the scene, everyone would get really excited, and the actors would go over there and cross it off. And it just kind of, you know, gives them like a little bit when you cross something off it gives them like a little bit of an endorphin rush and they all really liked it and so we just put more effort in behind it we you made it a bigger deal and i think it does two things number one the actors should always know what they're doing right now and what they're about to do so they can prepare themselves mentally if they have any downtime but make sure they're also in the right the right wardrobe and, you know, they're not asking you questions. They're not asking me constantly, what's the next scene? What's the next scene? What's the next scene? They can go to the little dry erase board and they can see exactly what the whole day is planned out. And then number two, like I said before, it gives them like a little bit of an endorphin rush when they go and cross something off. And especially when we're, when we have the momentum, we're knocking out things really, really fast and they get to go off, go over there and cross off all that stuff really quick. And they can see the progress that we're doing um, is super powerful. And if you can get to the point where you can cross off all the stuff on the list, then they feel really, really good. Um, but spoiler alert, I usually put a ton of stuff on there to make it impossible for them to cross all the stuff off because like I said before, I am trying to push them as far as we can possibly go. But I'd highly recommend it because it saves you time from, you don't need to answer all these questions. The actors are super clear on exactly what's happening at all times. 
what their first shot is and what their last shot is. And then it, it keeps the momentum going because I'm a little endorphin rush. All the, the actors are running over there to cross that stuff off. So I think that that's really something you should try and do. Super easy. $5 dry erase board. One of the best investments we've ever made. Yep, we absolutely love it. And I think, you know, what's really cool is like even throughout the day, once it's written on there, as we're kind of waking up, getting into the cycle um, of getting ready for the shoot, you know, probably like an hour or so before we like start with the call time and everything. Um, just you'll always see someone hanging by that shot list, you know, looking at it, seeing what we have to do. And it's a way you can really help dictate the momentum because for the one shoot that we were talking about where we had like a record day for DBS, I mean, that shot list was full. And when they woke up in the morning and they saw that, everyone was like, whoa, you know, we got to put it in today. And you know what? They all stepped up to the plate. So anything you can do to get your entire cast and crew on the same page, take ownership of the, the scenes they're about to do and have an understanding where they're at is going to be so critical. And again, you're coming from a lot of actors where if they do have experience on something like Netflix or Hulu or just any of the bigger productions, they're just told to stand here. That's it. So being able to give them that level of involvement of like, here's where we're at, here's where we need to get to. And I mean, you'll find like little fun moments where it's like, okay, two scenes until we do the big climax. All right, big climax. And it takes, you know, three hours and it's like, we are done. Boom. That feeling of crossing off the hardest scene you are going to film is that peak that we talk about when it comes to momentum. You want people to be excited for that climax. They gave their best performance. They hit on those high notes and you really need to be able to capture that lightning and I think, honestly, that shot list is a really, really easy way to do it. So being able to just, again, show your vision, show the structure is really just going to pay dividends in the sense of getting the team on the same page. So with that being said, I want to talk about what I think is by far probably the biggest pitfall with indie films, not only for budget, but also for time management. And that's going to be food. And I think if you even look at how we did food in the very beginning, it was more so like, we'll create some type of meals for everyone. We'll almost have like a set lunch or a set dinner. You know, it'll be cheaper if we get like a big meal to make. I used to make a whole bunch of sandwiches. We'd have like a sandwich table. Hey, everyone, let's break for lunch. That is probably the worst way ever to do it. And the way that we do it now is we basically act, ask each one of the talent, what would you like? We have that food available. When you have time to eat, you go ahead and you eat. And that's the same for all of the crew. And if you really think about it on the Hollywood set, it's why they have a catering table. But I think a lot of indie filmmakers I hear, you know, we'll make a meal or we'll do something or worse comes to worse, we will not have food or we'll make a big Uber Eats order or something like that. I think the worst thing you can do is have scheduled meals because that's just not going to happen. And if you can have food there, it's going to keep them hungry or it's going to keep them fed. Again, you don't want anyone hangry. And it's going to, basically make the, the set flow a lot. And I think this is one of the biggest roadblocks you can easily ax off if you just ask the talent what they want, have that food there for them so they can continue to roll. And you know, what are kind of your thoughts on that? I mean, I think food's really like underlooked. I think it's such a crucial part of your, your film. And I don't see anyone like giving it really the time and energy it deserves. Because food's going to be one of your biggest expenses on an indie set to feed a lot of people is extremely expensive. And there's a lot of waste, a lot of food that's not getting eaten. And it's just, you know, not ideal on a budget level, but also just on a, a time management level. You know, anytime that you have a big meal, everyone's getting, you know, they're going to feel a little bit slower and, you know, a, uh, a ill-timed meal can really slow down your production. So you really have to plan like a lot of this stuff out. And I think it's very overlooked. The strategy that we do now, like Kel mentioned, we try and get, you know, food that the actors want, comfort food, and then also main food, which is usually we try and get it in bulk or something that's cheaper um, that the actors feel comfortable with because you want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. So if they want something, even if it's a little more expensive, I still get it because it's a comfort food. They should have access to food 24 seven. You should never run out of food. They should be able to snack 24 seven. But I say strategically break your bigger meals because, you know, when you're going to actually do them is, 
it can be detrimental to your schedule if it's not planned out properly. Usually in the morning, we'll have a giant breakfast meal. And this is right before we start shooting. And I try and make them, you know, do an hour, an hour and a half before we start shooting because you don't want someone finishing up breakfast right before we're about to shoot. For lunch, we keep it flexible because once again, I'm trying to keep that momentum. I'm going to push them as long as they can go until they're like, I can start to tell they start to get very hungry. At that point, we'll break for lunch. And the same thing for dinner. Dinner's flexible. And if they start to get hungry, you know, during, during a, a sequence when momentum is very high, they have snacks available to go snack on and, you know, hold themselves out until we get a lull in momentum or a massive set change as far as like I have to set up, you know, a huge sequence and I have to change the lights, I have to change the camera, or we have to change the memory cards. At that point, I could call and say, all right, look, have dinner or have lunch. I would never be like, all right, five o'clock's dinner because you don't know where you're going to be at five o'clock. Um, so I say, just make sure they have access to food constantly, make sure they have food that they like, and then, you know, structure in a way that is friendly to make sure you have that momentum going and you can keep that momentum going and you're not breaking that momentum with uh, food breaks. Exactly. I mean, really, when you look at it, I typically, um, you know, I'll be one that'll probably do the food runs. I would say every other day is almost something there. We keep it very light and lean in the sense of what would you want? What are you looking for? And I can't tell you, man, actors light up when it's like, you got my go or whatever they like. They just, they're like, oh, sweet. Awesome. Thank you. Cause you want to keep them motivated in there. And just, I mean, going from the set of gone, I think we left with like maybe like a hundred dollars worth of groceries left over. And for this last set for the shapeshifter, we only had one bag. And the only reason we had the one bag is I, it said like spaghetti montage. So I thought we needed to have like garlic bread and spaghetti stuff, which I just misunderstood the list, I guess. And that was the only thing we had. All the food was eaten, all this, the, the water, like make sure you have waters. Again, make sure you have their energy drinks, make sure you have Starbucks like drinks, like all of those things are critical because it's those little things that add up and allow you to just function. And if it's going to cost you a little bit extra because it is something, you know, that's a little bit unique, it's worth it for the time you're going to save by having that person motivated for the food and having it, it something there. So, you know, that's something big. One thing I, I want to go back to real quick, I think we should probably should have said this during the technical level. One of the biggest recommendations we have is to have an editor on set. And, you know, it's called the dailies in Hollywood. They go ahead, they review what they saw so they can do it. And again, they have these massive budgets so they can do whatever they have. I think that most indie filmmakers are not doing this because again, it costs additional money and whatnot. And it's probably the biggest thing you can shoot yourself in the foot for. And all my job is, is to, I do a twofold. I make sure we have the data, which again, another big thing. Here's another tip. Buy uh, endless cards. Don't ever delete any footage. Just keep them on there. My job is to take the, the information. My job is to back it up. My job is to look at all the footage we have and my job is to put the roughest timeline together to ensure we have no video quality issues with at least one of the takes and no um, sound issues and then that it blends together. So do you want to talk about the importance of an onset editor, how it doesn't have to be the most technical onset editor, but how it is literally critical and it can save you so many times. And at the end of the shapeshifter, I had a nice little list of we need X, Y, Z, to fill in the blank and we got those. And because of it, it potentially saved us some pickups. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the first investment that I would have on set is to have an on-set editor. I mean, this is by far the most crucial thing that we have on set um, because all it takes is one actor to turn their mic off, the mic to fall off their chest you know, is a huge issue because I'm listening to both uh, lav mics that we use, but it's very hard for me to tell, you know, if there's any kind of issues. In the Shapeshifter movie, there was some weird frequency being played through um, one of the audio cords, which is bad, that we connected the lav mic to. Just what a weird coincidence, right? That could have ruined the whole movie, but I was able to go back and look at Kellen. I was like, listen to the audio. I was like, this is some weird stuff. Switched out the, the audio cables. And that's just like the basic stuff. I mean, your camera could drop frames or, you know, you can miss some shots or, 
you know, it, there's just a ton of stuff that an onset editor could say and be like, hey, like something's wrong with the camera or something's wrong with your audio. And man, I just, I don't know how it would be not having an onset editor going back from a shoot and then having to go through that footage. It'd be so stressful. Like whatever you have to pay the onset editor to get through and just to make sure the footage is good and that you have like a rough timeline is worth it because going through that footage in the dark, not knowing what you have, not knowing if there's any technical issues as far as like audio wise or camera wise, not knowing if it doesn't cut together and not knowing like if things are in focus or out of focus or, you know, there's other issues, whether it cuts together or whether it doesn't cut together, putting together that timeline would probably be so stressful. Cause right now I have like Kel's edited this stuff through. He knows like on the worst case scenario, we're going to get a movie uploaded, which is my number one goal is just get something rough uploaded. Even if I have to shoot with all the wides all the way through the movie, at least we have a movie. And I'm super stressed going through this stuff because I'm like, please let this not have audio issues. Please let this be in focus. Please let me, let me not have any camera issues. And I'm not even worrying about acting issues right now. I'm just trying to make sure that we have something to upload. And that's with having an on-site editor. If I didn't have that, I had to go through that blind, my blood pressure would be through the roof, like going through each scene, trying to make sure that we have everything we need to just get a final upload. So whatever you have to pay someone to come on there and, and on-set, on-site edit, and it doesn't need to be like a final polished cut, just make sure that things sound proper, they look proper, and they cut together proper is all you really need. Yeah, and I think another huge benefit you get from it is like having me on set with the footage immediately just completely ex- expedites our timeline. I mean, it really condenses the process of getting into the post production. Because here's what happens. You know, I get a card, here's the card, here's all the footage. I go through each and every one of those those shots. I organize them within the project file to say, this is scene this. Here's all of the raw for this scene. And I do that for the entire process. That alone saves you so much time that before, like, you know, you could even sit down, your brain's been completely fried when it comes to just the entire process of it. So you're, you know, not sure where you're at. You're looking for files. You're not sure what scene it's going to be. You literally have to spend almost like a good 20, 30 hours just organizing the data, like just pure data organization. So having that already done is a huge step. Having that confirmed on my end of like, hey, yeah, we're good. And, you know, I can tell you there's nothing better than when I'm able to go to Brendan, show him a scene. And he's like, oh, thank God. Okay, it works. Because then he can finally breathe and continue to move on. So one, it relieves the anxiety on set. But two, by the time Brendan's done with everything, you know, he has a nice timeline. He has everything organized. And it's the ability to then really pick these things apart and, I mean, realistically, you're looking at probably if you're not on it, you know, because again, I'm, I'm basically editing when I'm not being, um, when I'm not a, uh, an actor or when I'm not part of the set or, you know, when I'm not doing behind the scenes or one of those things, all of that time would be added and it would be additionally take much longer to just kind of find the things because they're not organized. So, you know, being able to, as I get the hard drive, immediately hop in, immediately organize and immediately put on the timeline, that just makes it such an easy editing process. And I think between the cost it's going to take, and it, it's easy for me, you know, I can go up to Brendan and be like, hey, did we get this? Like there were multiple times where I was like, did we get this one thing? And Brendan can either say, yes, we got it. Or we can say, no, add it to the list. And that last day, you know, the reason I was kind of pestering him is we had a whole list of things that we needed to pick up. These were little inserts. These were grabbing the handle. These were looking at this. This was a POV shot. And it was super critical. So anything you do with the onset editor, it's going to be something that's going to pay dividends. And, you know, it, it, it really is something where I think it's one of the reasons why we can have such a successful production, because we're so good at this process now that it really kind of sets us up from, you know, ideally having those issues in post-production. So the next thing I really kind of want to talk about is, you know, while we have the crew down, because it's mainly us now, and we understand what we're doing, you're working with actors and you're working with talent. And a lot of times that is a variable. You know, again, I think we have amazing actors throughout all of our movies and through what we've been doing. 
but we have had issues when it comes to actors just remembering lines getting emotional having issues come up being tired so you know do you want to kind of talk about what it's the best process is for working with an actor in general and then we'll kind of work into you know what happens when you go into certain issues so you know what's your approach to working with the talent to make sure that you not only get a good performance on them but more importantly get them in out of scenes done so that it, it continues to have a good momentum to it um pre-production that is that is when you work with the actors pre-production you don't have the time to be david fincher on the indie set you don't have a time to do 60 takes you don't have a time to really break it down and really work with them i'd love to trust me there is a time when i will absolutely love to just focus on the actor's performance and really work with them on set get 60 takes and really dive into their performance we just don't have the time on the indie set all this stuff needs to be done during pre-production. In my pre-production now, we have a, a large one-on-one -on -one meeting where I talk about the character, the character depth, what I'm trying to get, what my vision is for the character. We have another in-depth meeting on dialogue. So how they speak and you know any dialogue changes that they want, we kind of come to a collaboration and a meeting ground. Then we have a table read where they actually get to work with other actors and give them direction on working with other actors. On set, it's like very minor things. Um, sometimes there's a lot of organic um, things that are happening, like cool organic moments that we can add in there that I think make the movie better. But I'm not giving them any hard dramatic feedback just because we just don't have time to do that. And I really, like I said before, like my goal is to keep momentum up and make sure the actors are happy and comfortable. And if I'm sitting there critiquing every little piece of their performance, it's going to frustrate them. They're going to get upset. And it's just not something that we can like have. We just can't have, it can't happen. A lot of these actors are very new. They're very uh, fresh. Um, they're very green. So they don't, you know, respond very well to feedback. They have never really gotten a lot of feedback like that before. And you're sitting there nitpicking their entire performance. They're just going to get frustrated. So, you know, my job is to just make sure the goal is always clear. I'm looking for specific things that may, as far as like tone, um, that I don't want. And I make those small corrective, corrective changes. But once again, my goal is just get them in place where they feel comfortable and let them go. You're hiring them for a reason. If your actor is not giving you the performance that you want on your production, well, then you failed in pre-production, you failed in casting. And that's your fault. You should not be doing large directorial you know uh guidance giving a ton of direction on an indie set it's just you don't have time to do that and it's just going to cause your actors to lose momentum i completely agree i mean really a lot of the issues should be solved in pre-production and i think that's where you can identify that hey this might not be the right actor for us it comes down to multiple things you know are they late are they engaged are they reading the lines and the scripts those things can really be used to your knowledge Let's say though, you haven't done your pre-production, which is a very classic indie filmmaking thing to do. And you're now on set and your actor is just struggling to get through a single scene. And I would say we've really embraced the ability to cut. And what we tell our actors is even if you screw up, pause for a second, get right back to the scene because we can cut through it and we can still maximize the footage time that we can get. But I think something that we learned specifically in like the devil in the room and we're having some additional issues with it is if they are struggling just break it down line by line and then you're going to have to cut it in the indie film process or in the editing process as long as it's not found footage you can do this and it is much better in my opinion to get an actor struggling through a scene than to cut and try and get the whole thing and i think if people are looking for oneers or something like that you just have to embrace the cuts you know we do wide close up mid just so we have multiple cut points at all the time but from an editor's perspective i can basically take any actor's performance and i think i can make them have the best performance based on the takes they give me if you have multiple cut points so you want to talk about the benefits of having those cut points and more importantly how you have to bite the bullet and you can't be the director saying no actor we got to get this if they are struggling because that makes them feel bad they put pressure on themselves and every time they screw up then you might have another actor being like oh my gosh and before you know it 
now this nice little friendly team you have it's day six it's day seven one of the actors is having their issues and you can palpably feel that tension on set that's rising so you know what would you kind of say to helping out the actors if they do find themselves in that situation which again it does happen this is not easy yeah i mean if you have an actor that's struggling you first one just try and make them comfortable because usually when actors struggle they start to get in their head and they start to you know stumble over words and it's happened multiple times it's going to happen on your set um even uh the actors that are that do very very well with us um stumble it's just natural it's just what's going to happen sometimes the dialogue's difficult to say sometimes you just get caught up sometimes you're getting tired so you have to prepare this is where having the editor's mindset and understanding how to edit things is so crucial because I am constantly in my head looking about when I'm actually directing, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to edit this thing together. So I'm like, hey, all you have to do is say a couple lines here. And then, you know, she says her lines and then you just need to say a couple lines over here and we just go back and forth. You don't need to deliver the whole thing, you know, as one sequence. So if they're struggling and, you know, they're having issues, I just say, look, take a deep breath, say these three or four words and you're good. Take a deep breath, say a couple words, and you're good. And they start to do that. Momentum starts to pick up. I know that I have what I need to edit things, and it's a win-win. You know, I'm not trying to make people do these crazy wonder lines like it's a, a theater play. Um, sometimes you can really change people's performances in editing. I know how to edit, and as long as they're giving me, you know, crisp, clear dialogue, um, that we're good to go. Now you just want to be careful because it can become robotic. If they're not actually playing off each other in real life, then when you go to edit it, there can be some issues in there. But once again, I'm looking for that. Um, I'd rather have them go through the whole sequence and stop, stop and stutter. And I can say, Hey, go back and just give me that one little piece again. Um, just because it's, they could play off each other. It's a little more natural, but for the most part, I'm looking at how I'm going to edit these things. I want to make the actor feel comfortable. And if they have to take it line by line, then I'm completely fine with that. It's not a problem. And I'd probably anticipate that. So it's just going back to, you know, making the actor comfortable, having an editor's mindset and just, you know, problem solving when things come up, you know, actors aren't going to give you their best performance constantly. There's an eight day period. There's going to be highs and there's going to be lows. It's just how do you recapture that momentum and get them back on track? Yeah, I you know completely agree with that. And I think one of the bigger things, you know, too, in hindsight is I think it just comes back to having that misunderstanding of what actual filmmaking is with the editor's mindset. You know, I, I think people have the idea that in Hollywood or whatnot, you know, it is the entire scene and you nail the scene and everyone says their lines perfectly. And it was a single take and it was perfect. And then it was done. And that's just not the case. And understanding what skills you can use with the editing you know abilities of hopping back and forth you save a ton of time you know i look back we were forcing a ton of scenes that we didn't have to do because we could have done that we were like you know retake and retake and retake in the beginning and that's just the element of it so you know again really embrace those things that you can do to get the most out of your time and you know with that being said i think the last thing i really kind of want to wrap up with here is based on your experience from the start of production to where you're at now, you know, is there anything that we didn't kind of highlight or anything that really stood out to you and how the process has gotten easy and how we've improved in this process has gotten easier. And I think it comes down to, we simplified everything. And on top of that, we understood what the editor's mindset and knowing what we can and can't do in post-production has shaped our, our production process. Yeah, I think like, if you were to ask me, like my words of advice would be, you know, keep everything as simple as possible. Master the basics, or as tripod, shoulder rig, and Ronin. That's all you really need to make to probably do ninety-five percent of the shots that you want to shoot. If you can master that stuff, you'll be in much better shape. Keep the cast and crew as minimal as possible. Anytime you add someone to set, you know, they, they I'd focus on them as a liability uh, instead of an asset. Um, especially if you've never worked with them before. And then I, I think the biggest thing would just be, you know, understanding the three phases of filmmaking from screenplay to production to editing. 
having all three of those phases, having experience in all three of those phases just makes everything so much easier. You know, I'm writing scripts that are easy to shoot and easy to edit. When I'm actually doing production, you know, my mind is editing the scenes together. Like we mentioned before, if you have an actor that's struggling, I'm constantly thinking about cut points and how I'm going to edit it and how we're going to make everything work. And, you know, when you come down to like the editing part of the process, you know, you're just making sure that the scenes cut together and everything looks good. And that's just coming back to having an on-site editor on staff to just make sure that this stuff is actually working. So I think, you know, just understanding all three phases of filmmaking is going to make every single phase so much easier because you're setting yourself up to succeed and you understand what's possible and what's not possible. Because like, like I mentioned before, in the first eight movies, we were doing things that just were not possible on our budget. And we didn't have the experience to do it. We didn't have the technical skill to pull it off yet. We were still trying constantly to make this stuff work. And it's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It's just not going to happen. So I think that would be my, my two biggest things of advice would just be to, you know, make sure you're, you're good with all three phases of the filmmaking process and just make sure, you know, you're comfortable and you do your pre-production, make sure you get it all, you know, worked out before you start doing production, because that, that time crunch, the time pressure is, is so brutal. It really is, especially for an indie film that, you know, it can really mess up a lot of things, it can mess up you mentally, it can mess with your emotions. So I think really the biggest advice for having a smooth production is just make sure you handle a lot of this stuff in pre-production. It, it really is. Because again, pre-production is just experience. That's all it really is. And, you know, we keep hounding over and over. Getting more experience is going to really, really make it uh, so much better. And like, honestly, a, a stressful production and a, a broken movie will make you never want to make movies again. And where we're at now, and because of what we understand in our experience level, it's a blast. You know, we love production. I love being part of it. And I think that's one last thing I kind of want to end on. Let's, ha let's have a little bit of an upbeat. Production is so much fun. You know, being part of something, being part of that magic, it is something you never really experience. I mean, I've done a ton of things with a ton of different groups and people, and you never quite feel the camaraderie that you do when you're basically stuck on this project, working every single day. You instantly become friends. You have a ton of inside jokes, and it is absolutely a blast. So do you like production now that we understand how to avoid the pitfalls and we know we can get a movie? I mean, I enjoy it. It's super stressful. It's super high energy. It's super, you know, filled with adrenaline. Um, and, you know, like Kel said, when you have a whole bunch of people coming in and, you know, giving their all to something, everyone's being super creative. They're giving their own versions of something. And you take something that's on, you know, 95 pages of paper and you give it life and you give it organic, um, you know, organic energy. I think it's, you know, it's something magical. I don't think there's anything you can really do with like that compares to it. Um, it's almost like the highs of being on a sports team, meaning something super creative. And, you know, you're living with these people um, for eight days and it just kind of gets crazy and kind of gets wacky. But, you know, I'll tell you what, the feeling after a shoot, when you finally go back and you get some sleep and you wake up from that sleep and your brain is starting to come back a lot to life. I mean, you feel good. It's a great experience. And, you know, I'd recommend it, you know, obviously people who like film are going to do it at some point in life, but I think it's just, it's something very unique. Um, and as high stress as it is for me, um, I do enjoy it and I wouldn't make movies if I didn't enjoy it. So, I mean, it's, it's a wild ride, but when it gets done, man, you feel really good. And it's something that is so unique. It's very, it's very difficult to explain. Yeah, I, I completely agree, especially with that when you finally get some sleep part, because there, there's nothing better than that first sleep, knowing that you don't have to wake up and have this list of things to do right away. But all in all, you know, it really is something, like you said, it's a unique experience. I'm excited to do it again. And ideally, we'll get better and better. And hopefully, we can help some people out there avoid the pitfalls as well. So that's going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. Again, be sure to take a look at us online. Check out our Discord channel. That's the place to be. But until then, have a good one. <laughs>